Hello everyone. You are in the session Streamline End-to-End -end AI Pipelines, Pre-Process, Visualize and Build AI Faster at Scale on Intel Architecture. I am Meena Arunachalam from Intel Corporation. With me today, we have Mike Flaxman from OmniSci, Skip Dupree from Databricks. We will be presenting this session jointly now. So remember the excitement of last summer's Olympics, especially the track and field events like the men's and women's relays. Each member of the team is equally important and must run a world-class race in order for the team to be on the podium. You can think of an end-to-end -end AI pipeline in a similar manner. You may think it's all about machine learning and deep learning training models, but data loading, pre-processing, and feature engineering, not to mention deployment, is equally important and can take up a huge chunk of the overall end-to-end -end time and time to solution. And just like our relay team, optimizing each leg of the relay, or in this case, each phase of the pipeline, is equally important if we are to have a successful outcome. So here's what we are going to discuss today. First, a brief overview of Intel AI software. We optimize many packages across the entire pipeline to enable data and AI at scale and tools that make things easy. Second, we want to take a moment to highlight partnerships where we together drive data at scale. Finally, we want to take a few examples to really show what end-to-end -end means from data in to insights out. AI is often just a small part, and the entire end-to-end -end runs really well on Xeon. If you take the latest and greatest software that can fully utilize Xeon, fully utilize Xeon's parallel compute, large memory hierarchies, and low latencies. Intel architecture software optimizations span end-to-end -end AI pipeline and build upon the rich, fast-growing AI ecosystem, with some of the software packages having been downloaded hundreds of millions of times. Optimizations cover deep learning, machine learning, and big data analytics such as TensorFlow and PyTorch for deep learning, scikit-learn XGBoost for ML analytics, end-to-end -end data science tools like the Intel AI Toolkit and BigDL, formerly known as Analytics Zoo, that help accelerate every phase. All of this is built on the foundation of one API, which is Open Standards Unified Programming Model with constituent libraries that optimize for performance and productivity across different target hardware. Our rich partnership with hundreds of industry-leading partner companies, as well as end-user customers, pushes the envelope of innovation across entire end-to-end -end AI software ecosystem. Today, we have two of our key partners, OmniSci and Databricks with me here. First part of any end-to-end -end is to be able to understand data. We have partnered with OmniSci to drive interactivity at scale, analyzing billions of rows in just milliseconds, driven by a sophisticated JIT engine, fully utilizing massive parallelism on the CPU and modern memory hierarchies. Let me introduce Dr. Mike Flaxman, product manager at OmniSci, to get into it a bit more detail. Thanks, Mina. OmniSci was designed to solve a particular challenge with modern analytics. A lot of tools today allow interactivity or they allow scale, but they force you to choose one or the other. With very small data sets, it's not usually an issue. Legacy analytic solutions can deal with thousands of rows interactively without a problem. But if you push that to millions of rows or billions of rows, all of a sudden your options get significantly more limited. Our customers are interested in maintaining detail on really large data sets. So for example, we deal with utilities that don't wanna know just where the forest is, 
and all the healthy trees in the forest. They want to know where any sick tree is that might hit their power line. Similarly, telcos want to look not for all of the calls that they successfully complete, but out of billions of calls, where are the anomalies? So our platform was built to address those issues uh, for scalable large analytics, and we built it from the ground up with vertical integration. So we start with modern hardware, including some Intel hardware we'll talk about today, that is massively parallel, and we exploit that parallelism throughout the stack. In the middle, we've built uh, from the ground up a database that has a high-performance SQL engine and a rendering engine combined. So the data is in one place and can perform queries or rendering from that same uh, data. And then at the top level, we've built a no-code interactive visual exploration tool that we call OmniSci Immerse. So that lets you have the access from a normal web browser to very large data sets interactively rendered. In our partnership with Intel, we've been working on a variety of things uh, using several different technologies. But the punchline is, is things like the chart on the right, where we're able to scale on a single machine to much better uh, performance than, for instance, on a 21 node Spark cluster. Uh, how do we do that? Well, we use runtime compilation. We take advantage of being a columnar data uh, database. And we're engineering specifically to exploit parallelism. So vectorization, for instance. And we do that both on CPU and GPU. So the result is class leading performance and efficiency, making big data interactive. Let's take a look at some more results here. The On the left is the uh, rather famous uh, 1.2 billion row New York taxi data set. And you see on a, a set of standard queries uh, performance against the same uh, similar Spark cluster that I mentioned earlier. So a two processor local machine is doing uh, at least 5x better on a whole variety of queries. A really big query, maybe, maybe twice as well, but on typical queries, uh, 5 or 10x better. Um, so that is done entirely with CPU parallel techniques that I just mentioned. On the right, you'll see a different technology, which is Intel's Optane Technologies. So that's faster memory, basically, faster persistent storage. And you can see that uh, it scales really nicely with, uh, with our database. So let me walk you through what a, a typical dashboard might look like in our interface. Here we have uh, a map view, a temporal view, a series of indicator charts along the left, a heat map, a bubble chart, and some bar charts. Uh, this is kind of typical for a lot of our uh, applications that are you know, vertically built by our customers. Um, here we're looking at uh, cell phone call quality analytics. And so this is the kind of dashboard a telco might display. And so you can, uh, you can see that the, um, the line chart, for instance, is not just a static chart, but it actually has this interactive brushing capability built into it. So whatever you brush on the time chart uh, is uh, filtered, we call it cross-filtered, with all of the indicators and all of the other chart components. So that's um, basically the power of big data visualization combined with analytics. Our customers in Telco are using this for radio frequency mapping as well as uh, IoT device um, management. So our collaboration with Intel has been ongoing for a couple of years now, and we have started to see some, some really significant results. Uh, the first thing that we did, and uh, still a kind of amazing thing, is to adopt Modin as our primary data science tool. Um, so that now ships in our integrated Jupyter Hub environment. Um, we like to say that we make pandas fly. Um, that's an inside joke for data scientists, but uh, you know who you are. We have also uh, been integrating the OneDoll library across our platform. And so that's a very rich set of data science uh, algorithms, basically, uh, which we're making accessible uh, beyond data science to end users in our no-code uh, 
MERSE interface. And then we've optimized um, our forthcoming OmniSci radio frequency extension using TVB. Uh, that's in beta right now with three major telcos. So we're actively uh, working on that. And uh, we've got wonderful performance benefits from uh, the Intel work optimizing that. And then uh, first in queue to, uh, to be accessible to everybody is that OmniSci DB is currently being optimized for the Intel Optane um, persistent memory. And uh, that work is expected in our next release. And now back to Mina. Thank you, Mike. Thanks for the great collaboration to drive interactivity at scale and real-time decision-making. Now let's switch gears and talk about Databricks. Intel and Databricks have been longtime collaborators in open source Spark ever since its creation. We have innovated on features together, such as adaptive query execution, which really improves stability, robustness, and performance at large data scales. We also work hand in hand to ensure that Databricks unified data and AI platform keeps improving performance and cost by taking advantage of the latest and greatest hardware and optimizations so that you can scale as effectively as your data scales exponentially. Let me now welcome Skip Dupree, Databricks Accounts Director, to go into a bit more detail. Thank you, Mina. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to speak to everyone today. Uh, just going to give you a quick overview of who we are here at Databricks. Um, we're the data and AI company. We provide the first lake house, uh, which offers a simple single platform to unify all of your data, your analytics, and your AI workloads. We work with well over 5,000 customers today. And really, we're an organization that's dedicated to the open source community. And this can be uh, expressed through some of the most successful open source projects uh, that are in the data space today. Um, So taking a step back, I want to first, you know, data lakes and data warehouses have very complementary but different benefits that have required both to exist in, in most of the enterprises that we talk with. Um, data lakes do a great job of supporting machine learning. They have open formats and big ecosystems, but they have poor support for business intelligence and they suffer from complex data problems. Uh, data warehouses, on the other hand, are great for BI applications, but they have limited support for machine learning workloads, and they're proprietary systems with uh, only a SQL interface. And so it's in unifying these two that we could be transformational in how we think about data. And this is why uh, Databricks has invested so much into our Lakehouse strategy. And this is what provides a single platform to unify all of your data, your analytics, and your AI workloads, and it's a key enabler um, behind this innovation. A key enabler behind this innovation is what we call Delta Lake. Delta Lake provides you with the ability to build curated data lakes that add the reliability and performance and governance that you've come to expect from data warehouses directly to your existing data lake. You gain reliability with asset transactions. So now you can be sure that all of your operations in the data lake either fully succeed or fail. And you now have the ability to easily time travel backward and understand every change that's been made to your data. Delta Lake is underpinned uh, by Apache Spark um, and it utilizes advanced caching techniques um, and indexing methods. And this allows you to process and query your data on your data lake extremely quickly and at scale. And then finally, Delta Lake provides support for access control lists that give you much more control over who can access your data, what access they have to your data, that sits on your data lake. And it's with this foundation that I've just explained. Let's take a look at the lake house that's built on top of it. So the Databricks lake house platform uh, is unique in three ways. First, it's simple. Data only needs to exist once to support all of your data workloads. And it's a single common platform. Um, second, it's open. It's based on open source. It has open standards and it makes it easy to work with existing tools and avoid proprietary formats. Um, it's, and then third, it's collaborative. Um, so your data engineers, your analysts, your data scientists, 
um, are able now to work together in a much more easily fashion. Um, and this is what Databricks, uh, this is why we're the data and AI company today. Um, no one else can do this on a single platform uh, and a single solution. And that's a quick overview. With that, I wanna pass it back to Mina and uh, let her talk a little bit uh, more about Databricks and Intel. Thank you, Skip. Um, now let's talk a little bit about this unified data and AI platform, how it can harness new hardware to be even faster and cheaper. By simply upgrading to the V4 Cascade Lake instances, a typical big data analytics workloads gets 22 to 25% faster, which translates directly into cost savings. For the machine learning portion of the platform, Intel software optimizations can speed up the baseline by 2x, even an order or two orders of magnitude, across many different models by doing a very simple initialization to pull in Intel extension of scikit-learn and Intel optimized TensorFlow. That means many more experimentations or much larger data with reasonable turnaround and better models as a result. So as I mentioned in the introduction, data loading and pre-processing can take up a huge chunk of the overall end-to-end -end pipeline. So let's take a deeper look at the census ML workload that trains a ridge regression-based model using 50 years of US census data and predicts education level of people based on their income, age, and gender. Data ingestion into a data frame followed by ETL ops like drop and fill in A and others. And then it splits the data set 10 is to one to create a training set to build the model and a test to use for making predictions. TTS or train test split is repeated multiple times to randomize the split and remove any bias in avoiding overfitting. Model is trained and inference is performed. The DL pipeline is on a document level sentiment analysis workload based on the BERT large NLP topology. Here, the SSD review document dataset is loaded, sentences are tokenized, feature extraction is done, load pre-trained fine tuning model and conduct multi-stream inference and classified documents based on sentiment. There are also a lot of deep learning training only pipelines with long training times. But in this talk, we will focus on one DL inference pipeline and one ML pipeline. So when you look at the AI portion of the pipeline in isolation, you may get a much different picture of what solution is better. For example, in the census data set, a third gen Intel Xeon scalable processor significantly outperforms an NVA100 by a substantial margin. But is it really 5x faster in end to end? Similar story, but different outcome for the document level sentiment analysis. As the NVA100 performs a third gen, outperforms a third gen. Uh, Intel Xeon scalable processor by 2x. So same question, is it really 2x faster end-to-end? -end? So actually the end-to-end -end story is exactly the opposite for each case. For census, NVA100 is slightly faster. AMD plus NVIDIA together do the pre-processing, data ingestion, creating data frame, and ETL steps have lot of host to device, device to host transfers due to the limited GPU memory. Of course, AI is offloaded to NVIDIA. However, for the Xeon CPU case, all end-to-end -end phases, including AI run on the CPU, taking advantage of the cores, the large memory capacity in place, which helps Xeon a lot. Similar story for DLSA, but third generation Intel's Xeon scalable processor edges out NVA100 due to several optimization to the end-to-end -end workload, also taking advantage of the high number of cores and therefore higher number of instances than A100. 
So let's look at some of the ways we have optimized the frameworks to fully utilize modern parallel hardware. Scale effectively with improved load balancing and reduced synchronization events. Use all the cores effectively. Use single instruction, multiple data, SIMD instructions to process multiple data items simultaneously. The Intel Xeon Scalable Processor introduces Intel AVX 512 with ultra-wide 512-bit vectors for processing data in parallel. And finally, we optimize to make sure the frameworks use memory efficiently. Today, we have optimized numerous topologies across a wide range of DL usages for TensorFlow, MXNet, PyTorch, and Big DL for Spark. So let's look at what Intel is doing to optimize a typical ML pipeline like census. Here's what we do in each phase. Here is what Modin does, compute and data pre-processing across all available cores. So your pre-processing is really fast. Intel extension for scikit-learn gives you drop-in software acceleration in ML and analytics functions and algorithms using hardware features. XGBoost optimizations are part of the open source release. So let's look at what Intel is doing, for example, to optimize something like a deep learning pipeline, like our example of the document level sentiment analysis, starting with the software optimizations. We are using the Hugging Face APIs for creating this natural language processing sentiment analysis and other pipelines exclusively running on CPUs. The Intel One API Map Kernel Library helps in multiple phases with AVX 512 instructions. Intel optimizations for PyTorch are mainstream and achieve high compute and AVX 512 efficiencies. Both the One API MKL and the Intel PyTorch extension packages can be found as part of the Intel One API AI Analytics Toolkit. We further scale the instances across the Xeon scalable CPU to scale performance, all possible due to the large memory capacity and compute on Xeons. So let's look at what we can do with respect to optimizing performance by varying instances. Here is a four core ice lake die. One, unrestricted scaling up to maximum number of cores in a Xeon socket. For example, we can split this 40 core Ice Lake die into 10 instances with four cores per instance. This scaling ability benefits both real time and batch inferencing. End to end Ice Lake performance throughput can be higher than A100 with multi instance streaming, as NVA100 is limited to just seven instances per GPU. So how do we determine the right number of instances per socket? You configure each workload setting, the DL model, its size, batch size, data type, etc., to find the sweet spot to identify the optimal number of Xeon cores per instance. Here, we see the maximum number of instances for DLSA on 40 core, one socket ice lake, and it's well optimized for 10 instances each running with four cores. So, but at the end of the day, it comes down to maximizing your performance per dollar. As we showed earlier in the performance charts for sensors and document level sentiment analysis, Xeon using optimized PyTorch with Hugging Face APIs, scikit-learn and Modin optimizations, as well as utilizing multi-instances per socket delivered solid end-to-end time-to-solution. Xeon edged out NVA100 for DLSA and vice versa for sensors. But as this chart shows, Xeon is able to deliver high performance per dollar for both workloads without the added complexity of adding a GPU to your compute environment. So to summarize, just like our Olympic relay team, it takes world-class optimizations in each phase of the AI pipeline to deliver world-class results. 
We talked a lot about software today, but ensure you're taking advantage of all of the built-in Xeon hardware capabilities and scaling flexibility not available on NVIDIA GPUs. Utilize our robust ecosystem and partners like OmniSci and Databricks that are delivering world-class solutions today. And finally, I encourage you to download the Intel AI Analytics Toolkit and see for yourself how Intel can help accelerate development of your end-to-end -end solution. Thank you for your time and your attention. And goodbye.